for something more. I search the stars to knock on heaven's door. Creation groans for God to be revealed. And everyone we carry will be healed. My eyes on the sun, Lord, draw will be done. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. He finished my story. We're singing freedom, our testimony. We'll be singing celebrating that we are all called to the kingdom of God. Can we believe that this morning? That don't dismiss yourself from his table because he has not dismissed you. So this morning, we're going to declare and we're going to show you what the kingdom of God looks like, okay? Because it doesn't look like just one thing. We are all part of that kingdom. Come on. Let's sing this out with me. As if you ever wonder what heaven looks like It's looking like You have a question what heaven sounds like just let it fill the room hey and if you ever want if you ever want what heaven looks like it's looking like me it's looking like me and you hey. and if you have a question if you have a question what heaven sounds like
Take it. We bring everything, everything, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Hey, this is a house of miracles. This is a house of miracles. And this is a place where God desires to meet us to move in our lives. He's already doing that with a number of, of us who have come forward. And I tell you, I want us to pray right now because I believe, I believe God, you know, God wants to do something in our lives every day. But, you know, today is today. And I know he wants to do something in this moment, in this chapel. I don't believe we're here by accident. I don't, I, I don't believe our guest today is here by accident. And let's pray that in this, these coming minutes, that the Holy Spirit is going to have His way in this place. And, and I'd like to, and, and don't just make it a collective thing, make it a personal thing. Declare that the Lord is going to have His way in your heart, in your life, and open yourself to receive 
what he wants to impart, to deposit into you today. Lord, that's our prayer. And we're crying out to you right now. We're asking God that you would have your way among us. And we, we make it personal. And, we, and I say, God, have your way in my life. And I pray that that would be the individual prayer and desire of every person in this room. Lord, we are, we are inviting your Holy Spirit to move among us. God, we're asking, God, help us to be attentive to the, the preaching of the word. God, may we be ready to receive. May our hearts be open, our, our thoughts intent, listening, alert, careful to hear what you have to say to us, and then ready to respond as you determine and as you desire. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We're also praying for the country of Cambodia, of course, in Southeast Asia. Uh, this is a, a land that has faced so many challenges. I was just looking at, the, the, at, at some of the stats on it. But, you know, they, they do have freedom of religion. Uh, but there is a ban against any kind of evangelism. And so you've got, you know, you've got a real challenge for, for, for Christians wanting to, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, let's, let's pray for this nation, uh, obviously entrenched in Buddhism and in, uh, in, in the, the belief in, in various spirits. Uh, these are all coming into conflict with the truth of God's word. But how many of you know the power of God, the power of the spirit is greater? And we could, and, and because of our prayers... God can move and work in the lives of individuals and open up doors. And so we just lift our voices, Lord, on behalf of the nation of Cambodia. And we pray that these, uh, these strongholds of Buddhism would be, would, would be broken, would, would be torn away. We pray, O oh Lord, that not only would there be freedom to choose the religion of your choice, but there would be an, a freedom, O oh God, to express and to share that religion. O oh God, we ask this in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, for the, 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 the various places where they are training uh, ministers. God, I ask that, that you would meet the needs. And God, that you would raise up and call individuals to serve in churches. And may these churches stand boldly for you and for your truth. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. And uh, I want you to express appreciation. Hasn't our team done a great job this week? It, it's been just a super job, and I really, I really appreciate their attentiveness to the spirit, the, just the song selection, every bit, everything has been so, so solid. Just a few quick announcements I want to make you aware of. Uh, first of all, if you are looking for a summer job, the Lakeview Camp out here in Maple is looking for students to join their blue crew. Uh, you're seeing some of the signs on the screens around the monitors on campus. But this includes housing and meals uh, provided as well as an hourly uh, pay rate. Uh, they'll work in the multiple areas of the camp. Uh, there's plenty of perks. And you can apply today. I think the, uh, the email address for you to contact is available there, kcarpenter at lakeviewcamp.net. But you can see that on, on the monitors outside. I encourage you to check that out if you're looking for this opportunity. Uh, etiquette dinner uh, is scheduled for Monday. If you want to know how you are supposed to handle a fork, a knife, a spoon, and not look like a buffoon when you have a job interview, and I have eaten with some of you. I know what I'm talking about. So at least before you graduate, take part in an etiquette dinner. And if you want to do this when it's coming up Monday and you'll have the opportunity, there's uh, some uh, barcodes there on again on the monitors you can check out and uh, register for that. Finally, uh, this is a big uh, weekend for community outreach. Uh, and uh, it, it begins today uh, at 3 p.m. with uh, prayer in the Jeter prayer room, uh, interceding for our community. Then uh, the, the team will be going downtown uh, doing evangelism. Then on Saturday, March 25, worship at the park starting at 3.30. It's open to the public. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the new uh, the little amphitheater, right? Yeah, cool. That's a great area. Down, down by Fresh. Hope Dallas to allow students to participate in a micro missions experience. You can get involved by, again, scanning the QR code on the monitors. Check those out uh, or emailing smavpcommunity at sagu.edu. All right. We've got a double introduction here. Here's the formal one. We are so pleased 
to have Dr. Sam Huddleston on our campus. Uh, he's, he's a gentleman I have looked up to for a long, long time. This is not the first time he has spoken at SAGU, and, uh, and I think he will, he will admit that I am the, the most persistent person uh, in, in, well, in the United States of America trying to get this guy to come to our campus. Uh, He's, he's got a, an incredible background, uh, university administrator, uh, church planner, church pastor, elected to the, the highest you know, governing body of the Assemblies of God, our church fellowship. So highly respected uh, across our, our nation in terms of our church. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I like him because he's just real and he is, he's a blast to hang out with. So... Uh, Someone who knows Sam really well, David Dorsett, is coming forward, and he's going to provide a little more informal, relational introduction. I can tell you, if you were to read his resume, Dr. Huddleston's resume reads like a little novella. It's both interesting and long. But I've known him for about 30 years now, and I can tell you this one thing about him that all of the accolades, all of the titles, all of the positions, all of those things mean nothing compared to the person who's standing right next to him at any given time. He's got a, a picture in his office that says, people aren't gonna remember what you say, people aren't gonna remember what you do, but people are gonna remember how you make them feel. Dr. Sam and his wife brought a team out to China about 10 years ago, and they were doing a project with us. We got to the end. We were in Beijing. We were going to see them off the next day. They were supposed to, to fly out. So I said, look, we don't have to be at the airport till, till 1030, so let's all sleep in. It's been a long week. We're going to sleep in. We're going to get to the airport. The next morning at 630, my phone rings, and it's Dr. Sam. Hey, you're up, right? Why don't you meet me down at the, at the door of, of the hotel? So I go down there, and he says, we're going to go for a walk. So we walk out the door, and as soon as we walked out the door, he turned around and he looked at me, and he said, Dave, he says, what is God doing in your life right now? What is God saying to you? And for the next two hours, he spoke into me. He heard me, he listened to me, and he spoke the word of God into my life. And I want to tell you today, I promise you, if you will listen with both of your ears, God's going to speak to you today through this wonderful, wonderful man. And I am thrilled to introduce to you my friend, Dr. Sam Huddleston. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. He forgot to tell you that I've known his wife longer than him. <laughs> I was a church planner, and she was working in the district office, and um, she helped me. And then I called one day, and uh, she no longer was working there, and I realized she gave me up for somebody else. <laughs> so I appreciate that couple. It is a privilege for me to be here. Uh, <laughs> I said if I apologize in the back to Dr. Bridges, I wouldn't have to do it up front. But he is very, con very persistent. And uh, if, I didn't, if I hadn't had two knee surgeries, I would be on my knees asking your forgiveness. And thank you, brother, for allowing me to, to be here. My dear friend, Gordon Butler, um, I wanted to come here for two reasons. I wanted to come here to be with you. And I just wanted to come see my friend, Gordon. And seen him since Joan had passed away. And, but I'm going to tell you something. Don't ever ask him to substitute teach. He was substitute teaching as a pastor in one of our inner cities. And there was a little boy. He just was, just ask him, he'll tell you about it. He, was, he just wasn't, you know, Gordon is a retired, you know, not just a sergeant, but he, he was really somebody in the military, and he's used to giving orders and people taking them. But this little kid wasn't taking orders right. And so finally one day he just looked at him and said, son, you know I'm a preacher, don't you? He said, yeah. He said, let me tell you what, if you don't straighten up, I will kill you and do your funeral for free. <laughs> you, you don't want to do that <laughs> in the public school. It's good to see my friend. It's good. I met Jay and Terry yesterday uh, on the golf course. 
and I've already mentioned Dave and Gail, and then Dr. Ku Young came and greeted me, uh, and, and that was very appreciative. Let me show you a couple of pictures. This first picture um, is coming up on the screen. I think it says 150. Let me tell you what that means. Every day at 150, an alarm goes off on my cell phone. It just buzzes because I'm normally in a meeting or something, but it doesn't distract me from doing what 150 means to me. We are still one nation, and we are 50 states. I kind of believe that if we prayed more and talked less, God would do more. I have a friend. I can, talk, I can listen to any of you talk about whatever political viewpoint you want. You'll never know mine. My wife doesn't even know mine. It's not important. I'm just one voice. I don't think I really have a lot of uh, influence, even in her. It took me a while to realize that, fellas, but, uh, you know, I'm, I, I suggest things to her. And uh, this friend told me one day I'd spoken, and he said, I don't agree with what you said. I said, what do you believe? He told me, and I walked away. I said, you ought to live what you believe. And a few weeks later, he came back. I just met the guy. It wasn't a friend. I just met him. A few weeks later, he came back. He says, you really messed me up. I said, what do you mean? He says, last time I talked to you, I told you, I didn't agree with what you said, and you said, what do I believe? And I told you what I believe. And you said, why don't you live what you believe? I'll live what I believe. And I said, yeah. He said, yeah. I said, so let me ask you another question. What do you believe? He told me again. I said, why don't you live what you believe, and I'll live what I believe. And I walked off again. See, a lot of folks think their opinion means a lot. You don't believe me? Go look on Facebook. A lot of folks think God died and he appointed them. I can listen to any of you in this room tell me whatever you want to tell me, and I'll walk away. I said, don't forget now, we're having a meeting tomorrow, you're buying lunch, what have you. I'll get in my car, roll up the window, turn on some music, look around, make sure you're gone, and I'll say something like this. He's an idiot. <laughs> if he expects me to believe that, he's a righteous, certified, credentialed idiot. <laughs> because I am more concerned about a relationship than I am about being right. This gentleman that I met, we became dear friends. For the last 20 years, he's been coming to my house once a month with a group, and they pray with and for my wife and I. We have buried our fathers. We have gone on mission trips together. We have gone on cruises together. Why? Because I won't argue with him. And he will, argue, he will debate any of you in this room. I took him with me one time to the governor's prayer breakfast. He goes, you know, I'd like to say something to the governor. I said, yeah, come on. Go. I'll, and I'd been to few of them. So we get close to the governor, and the governor's getting ready to get into his limousine to leave. I said, excuse me, governor, my friend, he would like to say something to you. He goes, yeah. And he looks at the governor of California, and he says these words. Just want you to know I didn't vote for you. <laughs> the governor says, I don't feel bad. Some of my family members didn't even vote for me. And I'm standing up there. I just turned my back to him. I'm just, what in the world is wrong with him? That's just who he is. And I love him for, in that moment I didn't love him, but I, you know, I, I, I love him for who he is. I'm not trying to change him. If we would be more trying to unify our nation and the church, we'd be better off. And some of you may not know, so I'm just going to throw this out at you. I won't be back for a while. Your opinion don't really mean too much. <laughs> not even to the people you think it means a lot to. 150. Here's another picture I tell you, show you. This next one comes, that's my, that's my, now those are my grandkids. All 13 of them. So let me tell you what that means. That means I'm loved a lot and broke a lot. <laughs> but it's a happy broke. You don't believe me? <laughs> Look at my cash app. They finally introduced me to that a few years ago. And my wife won't let them put it on her phone. She would just tell me, send them some money. Why don't you send them some money? Dear? I don't have cash yet. Let me put it on your phone. Nope, I don't want it. I don't want it. Those are my 13 grandkids. The oldest is 26. The youngest is 11. I either walk. I don't have an opinion unless you and I, I'm listening to you, and we're going to talk about Jesus. I can normally make an agreement on Jesus. This next PowerPoint is my whole family. There ain't much I wouldn't do for them. I made a decision at 19 years old. I was in a very bad space. I'd done some crazy stuff. But, and I said, Jesus, I don't want to live like this. I even told God I didn't believe he existed. I said, but I do know one thing, God. Your last name ain't damn. 
And that's how I use God's name. And at 19 years of age, I made a decision. A year or so later, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. I am a bona fide. If you've never met one, I am a bona fide. But what has kept me all these many years is waking up in the morning, praying in the spirit, walking through my, praying over my grandchildren, telling them I love them, telling them they're going to be world changers, introducing them as I'm walking into school in front of great audiences, telling them you're going to change the world. But at 413 every day, I pray for them. Pray for each one of my sons, my two sons and their spouses by name. My daughter and her husband by name. And each one of my grandchildren by name. I was in San Salvador last week and my alarm went off at 4.30 and went off 4.13 and 1.50. And I prayed for our nation and I prayed for my family. You ought to have something on your phone to remind you to pray. And especially, especially for our nation. For our nation. I don't care who's in the White House. I really don't. They ain't never coming to my house. <laughs> and I pray for them. I pray for them. I pray for them. Father, I thank you for this privilege that I have to speak today in this house of miracles. And I do believe you're going to do some miracles today. Pray for our nation, our president, his cabinet. I, I know, Father, from going to presidential prayer breakfasts, there are some faith field believers that are walking those hallways. I pray that you will help them to speak up and stand out. I pray for this school, this leadership, and I pray for the few words you've given me, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You sung a song. This is a house of miracles. This is a house of miracles. My, my goal today, I don't, ha I don't have a sermon. I wanna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to speak to you like I do my grandchildren. I don't preach to them. I talk with them. And I'm truthful with them. Been truthful with them all their lives. Here's a phrase you, you'll never hear me say. Let me be honest with you. Now, those of you that like to use that phrase, let me just explain to you what that implies. You've been lying. <laughs> oh, I know what you mean. But what it implies is you've been lying. So I don't use that phrase. But I'm truthful with them and my second oldest granddaughter of my daughter's, she said the other day, she said, Papa, we're having lunch. She goes, how come you don't drink alcohol? <laughs> and I sat there thinking, how do I want to answer this question? I looked at my wife. I said, honey, you go first. <laughs> now, my wife's been saved all her life. She's been in church. All, she can't even tell you when she was saved. When I took her to her 20th class reunion, one of the greatest evenings of my life, all of these girls in her class, little, little town she grew up in, they were coming up to me half drunk. Oh, you're the one that married Linda. Yeah, I'm the one that married Linda. Yeah, you know, she wouldn't like us. Us. Oh, yeah, we partied, we did this, we did that. We did a whole lot of stuff. Linda wouldn't do stuff with us. She was always going to church. I'm going to tell you something, gentlemen. That was one of the happiest moments in my life. Nobody was coming over and saying, hey, baby, what's up? You know, you remember? I just, I, I wanted to get a t-shirt. I am the one who married Linda. <laughs> That's her story. She said to my granddaughter, our granddaughter, I accepted Jesus at a very young age. I learned that he was enough. And I'm just sitting there really at the age I am now going, man, I, I, it took me a long time to figure that one out. She said he was enough. I had all kinds of other things I liked to do. She loved to skate. She loved to, she loved to sing. Could have been recorded by some very top names. If I told you the names, you would know the names. But this is what she said. I didn't want to pay the price they wanted me to pay just to be on some, a record. So then my granddaughter says, well, Papa, how come you don't drink? I told you I don't. Let me be honest with you. I don't do that phrase. I looked at her and I said, baby, your grandpapa don't drink because he like it too much. She looked at me. She wasn't surprised. She, she didn't go. She didn't, she didn't expect me to give her a Bible verse. I said, I drink, I, if I drink, there's going to be some problems. I said, so your grandfather wants you to know, I like drinking today. I have prayed the Holy Ghost to take it away from me. I, I can drive by. See, I live in the center, by the valley, and you can, they've got more wineries there. I can drive by one of them wineries, and I almost run off the road. It's kind of like... I like the smell. I mean, I, 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 I like, but I don't drink. I don't drink. drink. Drinking made me act like a fool. 
And my dad used to say, well, son, I'll tell you what. You never met a person who was an alcoholic that didn't start with one drink. And then he would say, I, I don't know how you're drinking anyway. He, he would say, you know, it tastes nasty. And my dad was a big man, and you didn't talk back to him. And I, I never had the courage to ask him, how do you know it even tastes nasty? <laughs> she says, okay. Thank you, Papa. I said, but like your grandmother, it took me a minute, but I found out that Jesus could fill all my needs. I don't need a bus. He is my bus. One of my grandsons, he's 13, he's a little, he was a little over 12 then, and um, he's very intelligent with math. And, and I didn't know where this conversation was going, but one day he just said, Papa. I said, yeah. He said, how old are you? I told him how old I was. He said, my daddy is such and such an age, right? I said, yeah. He said, that means he, you were 16 when he was born. Now I know where the conversation was going. I said, oh, uh, Yeah. And he looks at me, see, he wasn't raised on a farm. Like, when you're raised on a farm, like some of you, you get to see all the, how things are born and all kind of stuff on a farm. Well, I mean, at a young age, I knew how things, but he wasn't, he's not been raised on a farm. So he had all these questions and he said, Papa, how'd that happen? How'd what happen? Well, you know, you're 16 and you know, how'd all that happen? <laughs> and I looked at him, I said, you know, son, you need to talk to your father. And his brother looked at him just kind of, went, uh, you know, I want to talk to you this morning. It won't be long. Having said that, you saw the pictures of my grandkids. Let me talk to you for a moment. Let me tell you some of the things I talk to them about. Sometimes I'll talk to them. My granddaughters, I have eight, five grandsons. I'll talk to them about Eve. And I'll talk about how much power and influence they have as a woman over a man. And then I tell them this, it ain't what you think it is. It ain't what you think it is, sweetie. And always remember this, you are the prize. They're not the prize. You're the prize. And then I tell them what to look for when guys come. They have never heard me blow a horn in front of the house. Telling them to hurry up. I don't care if it's raining or snowing, and it doesn't snow in Sacramento. But if it's raining, I will not, I'll call him on my cell phone. I'll either get out and go to the door. I said, now, if a young man come here and he can't walk to the door, don't go. They just say, you know what? We ain't going nowhere. I said, and if they come down wearing the pants down the hit, don't you, listen. You, oh, God. I said, you, you don't want your grandpa to go to jail, do you? You know, I love Jesus, but I can love him in there too. So I teach them about Eve. I tell, teach them how making the wrong decision. I'm trying to influence a man wrongly can get you in trouble. I have an incredible wife. I'm serious. I have woke up in the middle of the night. I could, my wife is in the closet praying for me. I have a praying wife. Not one who says, now I lay me down to sleep. When I go to work in the morning, I've told her, I said, I need a lot of, I don't need a lot of things in life. I really don't, honey. <clears throat> but I do need you to pray for me every day when I walk out that door. She always says this. Lord, go with him. And may the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost go with you. One of my grandsons, she tries to teach them little Bible verses and stuff. And books of the Bible and who the Holy Spirit is and all the rest. So one day, they're at the house. And she says, the father who, come on, may the, she always tells them, the force goes with you. And they'll say, okay. And she'll say, what's the force? And one of them, I know, I know, I know. What is it? What is it? The father, uh, they were a little younger then, the son <laughs> and the ghost. <laughs> uh, you're right, yeah. But I want them to know the influence. And then I'll tell the guys about Adam. I'll tell them how much damage you can cause by listening and making the wrong decision. Once you know what God wants you to do. Don't try to flim flam God. Yeah, I, I think it was God. It could have been God. I, 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 no, 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 no. Once you get it, do it, son. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. One of my grandsons, he plays at a university in Oregon basketball. Not how many points he scored. Nobody talked about his ability to play. And he went up as a walk-on, and the coach told him, we don't, we don't, we don't need anybody else. And uh, within a couple of weeks, he was, he was first strength because he believes in himself because we've raised him to believe in yourself. 
And all these people, every, when they would meet me, they'd say, excuse me, because we had on T-shirts, his number, our name. Father, it's kind of like going to your wife's 20th school reunion. It's like he's, he's, a, he's a long ways from home, but he's living out what he was taught. Sometimes I'll talk to the boys about Moses. I said, don't try to do God's will in your own power. You could end up on the backside of a mountain. And then I'll look at my girls and I said, now don't become like Miriam and her, or her other brother. They talked against Moses because they did not like his Cushite wife. You see, she was different than them. And the next thing you know, she was whiter than snow. Because God said, well, 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 since you feel that way against the man of God, let's see how you like leprosy. God doesn't need our opinion. He does what he wants to do, whether we want him to do it or not. Watch what you say. I tell my granddaughters about Ruth and the power of being committed. See, because sometimes you can only see what's going on right in front of you. Ruth just wanted to take care of mother-in-law, Naomi. She ended up being the grandmother to the greatest king ever lived in Israel. Because she was, she was looking out here. She was different. She was committed. Tell them about Boaz. He accepted responsibility for the family. I tell my grandsons, I said, don't mess up my name. I said, it's not yours, it's mine. I said, that's what my grandfather told me when I was acting a fool. He said, now, boy, I'm going to tell you something. My grandpa was a popo. He said, I'm going to tell you something, boy. That last name you have, Huddleston, he said, that's my name. It ain't your name. Now, you either change your name or change your character. And he turned and walked away. I did change, but it was years later. And when the governor of the state of California gave me a full unconditional pardon for my years of being involved in the criminal justice system, I did crime and they gave me justice. I went out to his grave and I stood over his grave. And I said, are we good? Because I told him at his funeral I was going to get his good name back. I said, the governor of the state just gave you back your name. Are we good? Boy has cared about the family. Teach my, my grandsons. We take care of the women in this family. We don't put our hands on women. Well, they would tell me, they would, well, Papa, she did. I said, you should have ran faster. <laughs> well, they just always, I said, you're right. And when I give them money, and the boys will just sit there looking down because they know whatever they get, the girls going to get more. I said, they always get more. Now, when you get as pretty as your sister, I'm going to give you more. <laughs> I tell them about Mary. What do you do when people don't believe you? You know, you know, nobody believed that young lady when she said she was pregnant by God. But it didn't bother Mary. She just kept on. What do you do when people don't believe you? I tell them you got to stay faithful. Tell them about Peter. When you blow it, when you deny him, repent, get up, and continue on the path God has called you on. But we always end up talking about Jesus. These are not Sunday school lessons. This is just as we're walking to school or we're, they're driving me somewhere. They all like to drive my car. I try to have a nice car because they love to drive it. And then the, re the real reason they like driving their grandpa to places to speak and what have you, I pay them. So let me tell you something. I'm one of them grandfathers that don't mind paying my grandkids for their time. I want them to know you are very, very special. You are very, very valuable, and your time is valuable, and I'm going to raise you right. I started paying them when they were young for reading books. I said, you know why Papa's paying for reading books and doing these, these book, book reports? Why, Papa? Because one day them grades are going to turn into paychecks. They like to drive me, and then we have these conversations. And I'll just, I'll just pepper them with questions. What's the greatest thing going on in your life right now? And what is Ricky's name? Papa, his name ain't Ricky. Well, he's Ricky to me, okay? But you see the Ricky are dudes, you know. And then when I show up, I try to, I laugh at my sons and my son-in-law. I said, oh, man, this is y'all's turn now, man. I'm having a great time watching y'all do this. I walk in, 
look at the young boy. I, sometimes I'll just give him a hug. Son, I'm so glad you're here at the house for this event. And I'll look over here at my son-in-law or my sons, and if it's whichever daughter is the boy connected to, and they're just sitting there. <laughs> I look at my son-in-law and say, oh, no, 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 bro. You know, you, you, you took my baby. You took my girl. Your turn now. And he got four. Well, tell him about Jesus. I tell him how Jesus saved their grandfather. I tell them how my life been turned around. And I tell them, here's the plan. I'm never going to embarrass you. Never. Never will your grandfather do anything saying that. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to embarrass your grandmother. I am not going to embarrass God. I said, here's the deal. You are not going to embarrass me. Do you understand? And then I tell them this. But in case you do, let me tell you this. What did you do to earn my love? Oh, we were born in the family? No. Oh, uh, I'm a girl? Boy? No. And they, they, they come up with all kind of creative stuff. I just let them go on and on. And then finally I'll tell them these words. You didn't do anything. They were getting letters from me before they were born. This is the kind of family you're coming into. Your papa's in, I don't name the country that I'm in. I want you to know where I'm at because one day I'm not going to be able to come home and I want you to know what I'm doing. I want you to know where I'm at. And then I would send a copy of the letter to their parents and I would say, this is the letter that is in this sealed envelope. You open it for them when they can read. I'm intentional about life because something in the back of my head tells me I ain't going to be here always. They were watching. How many of you have ever seen this movie, Coco? So I go to my, my son's house and my two twin grandsons are watching this movie, Coco. Well, Coco is a movie about the celebration of the dead in, in the Hispanic Mexican culture. And I'm sitting there watching this going, what the heck is this? Skeletons and ghosts and I'm going, but it's my son's home, so I, I, I can't run things there. And they just, my grandsons are watching it. So I go home, a couple of days later, they come over and I go, hey, you guys want to watch Coco? Yeah, yeah, Papa. I put it on. And every now and then I'd stop and I'd say, what, 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 tell me what's going on. You know, Papa's a little old. I, don't, I knew what was going on. Tell me what's going on. Get to the end of the movie. I said, what's the takeaway of this movie? And my grandchildren say, my grandsons, they go, Papa, the, the takeaway, what's that? I said, every time you read a book, every time you watch a movie, every time you're having a conversation, somebody has something they want you to leave with. Oh, so what is what they want us to remember about the movie? Yes, they want us to remember that you're not dead unless people quit talking about you. I looked at my grandsons. I said, they don't ever let me die. And they went, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Teach them about Jesus. Now, I told you all of that to tell you in short fashion why I'm really here. I came and I was praying and just me and Jesus. I've been thinking about this. First time I've ever said this in this kind of a context. You have loved Jesus all your life. You like my wife. Since you have been in college, you have faced all sorts of challenges. Many people you thought cared about you, you found out they really didn't. They have made fun of you. They've even called you names. They've tried to get you to do things that were totally against your values and belief in Jesus. You have even gone in private places and just cried your little eyeballs out because you said no when you wanted to say yes. You know your decision was right, but you were left alone. So the presence of God comes on a campus, and you're the reason why. Because he wants you to know, listen, I'm so proud of you. You have no idea. We're doing backflips in heaven because of your faithfulness. And he says, you don't see it now. You don't see it now. But I got something in store for you. You just stay faithful. So I'll come talk to you. I'll come talk to another group. You know about Jesus. You have known about him all of your life. Most people think you are a Christian. But if you are, I'm white. Is that plain enough? Let me be honest with you. In your pretending to be a Christian, you have been used by the enemy in ways that has brought harm to others in this group. For years, you have played the part, but in your heart, you know it. You're on fire for the kingdom. 
pe fooling people all around you. Your plans for your life do not match the values of what you are learning here. You're living in a backslidden state. Your heart is cold. You are miserable. I plead with you to return home. Now I want the gentleman that was playing the keyboard to come back. I'm so proud of you young people that love Jesus. I'm so proud of you because I didn't have that kind of courage when I was your age. I wish I had. I got a totally different story. I got a testimony because I've been in jail. That is not the testimony I want for my girl. I want my granddaughters to be like you. I want my grandsons to be like those of you in this room that are not stuck on yourself. But you are stuck on a man. His name is Jesus. And I applaud you this morning. I come to challenge those of you, you knew about Jesus. You know who you are. You know who you are. And I'm, I'm trying to tell you, listen, I spent five years in locked up. But I have been to every continent on planet Earth except one. Because I finally said one day, I've had enough. I've had enough. And I want Jesus. I want Jesus more than anything. My grandkids have never had to see me locked up or anything like that. Never seen their grandpa drunk. No one has ever told them, yeah, I know your grandpa's man of God. He says he's a pastor, but I saw him with sister so-and-so. Never have, never will. Because at 19 years of age, you're in a hotel paid for by the state of California. I went out on a yard one night and I said, Jesus, I'm a candidate for whatever you have to offer. And I wasn't playing. Standing before you as a young man, as an old man now, I got good old-fashioned jailhouse religion. It has lasted me a long time. My wife loves me. I love her. We've been married a long time. But it's because of Jesus. You know, Jesus, you were raised right. But for whatever the reason is, you got this rebellious thing inside of you. And I'm here to tell you, all you're going to do is destroy yourself. All you're going to do is prove the word of God right. And God is saying, Ali, Ali, oxen free. Whoso will, let them come. And then there's that group of you that have literally, you like the prodigal son. And when you wake up in the morning, you can't see him, but he's in the room. And he's just saying, come on back home. This ain't for you. This ain't for you. Come on. This ain't for you. I got plans for you that will blow your mind. The word of God says, eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for them, but he has revealed them to us in the spirit. He got a man for you, young lady. He got a wife for you, young man. You ain't got to sell cheap. Don't, 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 don't sell yourself cheap. I got the cream of the crop. And what I deserve was some snagger tooth, bald head, whatever. When my wife walks in the room with me, they know I'm from the country. They know I was raised on a farm. They can look at me and tell, yeah, pick your shoe up, man. You still got that, uh, you know, cow manure on the bottom of the shoes. I'm just a country boy. I used to ride pigs. But when my wife walks in, because she, she's a shoe fanatic, she got more shoes. She needs another pair of shoes like I need another wife. She got more shoes. And her granddaughters look up, they go... They look down, they look up, they go, oh, Papa, these shoes right here go in those boxes, huh? I said, boxes? Those boxes are full of shoes. Money. And I love the fact that she likes sales. I like it. I'm just going to buy it. I ain't got time to shop. She'll say, honey, if we go back down to the other store where we were at 20 minutes ago, back at the other end of the mile, I can save $3. I said, I tell you what, I'm going to give you $3. Because my feet just said, if I don't get off of them, they're going to put themselves in my pocket and see how well I walk on my behind. <laughs> so we ain't going back down. And my daughter's the same way. The Spirit of Jesus is here. Those of you that, you know you love Jesus. You know you love Jesus. And this, you've had some challenges in this school. Everybody stand if you're able, okay? 
That's another thing. Don't stand up in front of folks. Everybody stand. Everybody can't stand. I was in a meeting one time, guy sitting on the front row in a wheelchair and the preacher, everybody stand. I wanted to run up this, excuse me one second, preacher. That means you too, buddy. <laughs> Apparently it means you. He said, everybody stand. If you're able and willing. I'm so glad I'm here with you. I look at you and I, I wish I could hug all you. I got some incredible grandkids. People say, what are they doing? Are they, huh? Because they think because of what I do and who I am that my grandkids surely must be doing incredible things in churches and all the rest. And this is, this is my answer to everybody. They're on the path. What path? Same path you are. Path of life. We're all on the path. Because if I start saying, well, you know, this one graduated from this Bible college and this one is doing this, this one's going to law school. What about the one that's not doing as, I ain't doing that to my family. You know, the next question is, well, so then what are they doing? No one's ever asked me that. Because the answer to that question is none of your business. You take care of your family, I'm going to take care of mine. You hear this morning, you say, you know what? I love Jesus. And I want everybody to know I love Jesus. I mean, I really love Jesus. I want you to join me right here. Come on, I'm going to pray over you. He said, you've described me this morning in the ones that love Jesus. I want you to come up here. And while they're coming, some of you, you know who you are. Everybody else in this room knows who you are. You just, <laughs> you, you are living, you are a shell. You're just a shell. You know you ain't living a quarter's worth of salvation. Jesus, you are so far apart that it's just a shame. And then there's those of you that have totally just, you know, you kind of backslid. That's kind of, you know, when you say somebody's kind of backslid, that's like saying, well, they're kind of pregnant. No, you're either pregnant or you're not. <laughs> you backslid or you haven't. I didn't come here to browbeat you. I didn't come here to make you feel bad. I come here to tell you about a God who says, I love you. <laughs> Give me a moment, just a moment. You know how much you're needed in the black community and any community God leads you to. I do prison ministry. There's way too many of us in prisons. To stand up here this morning, see you and you. You have no idea what that does in my heart. You're at an incredible college, get an incredible education. Not everybody can take advantage of that. You're learning to adapt. You've experienced some stuff here that you don't like, but you're here. Don't you run. You keep saying yes to Jesus. Yes to Jesus. And some of you over here, you don't know what community God going to put you in. I just went to Bible college to get an education so I can get a good job, pay for my family. And they're saying, you know, I'm at a predominantly white Assembly of God church in Vallejo, California. My wife says, honey, we're the only black folk here. I said, I don't know. She said, this church is all white. I said, no, it's not. We here. She said, it's all white. <laughs> it's just seven years. You don't know what God's going to send you. We all have a plan. If you don't have a plan or even something you think you want to do for God, you're in the wrong place. But don't be so rigid that you're not open to what he wants to send you. God bless you, young people. God bless you, young people. This world needs you. Some of you need to really get involved in the political system. We need you. Because all them opinionated folks, I don't care what you want to watch. CNN, Fox, I don't care whether you're Republican, Democrat, uh, Independent, drinking tea, I don't care what you're doing. <laughs> we need some people that are sold out for Jesus and because they've been educated they know how to communicate yes. I want y'all to know today he's telling us God is going to judge you I mean nobody want to hear that <laughs> <laughs> that shines brightly it starts here because if he can mess up your life on this campus he got you last story I'm in a class, art class. What does art have to do with preaching the gospel, telling people about Jesus? I don't even open a book. But in every class, there's something that they do every year in, at the end of the class. What is that called? 
a final. And I, at that point in my life, I'd sit in the front. So I'm sitting in the front, and I'm going, oh, my God. I have no, I don't even, the only thing I got right on the paper was my name. But I'm sitting in the front, and all of a sudden, I realize if I look up, I can see the page, papers that are turned in. So I just thought, hmm, CDF. Somebody else turned their paper. So if you copy off one paper, then they know you cheated. But if you copy off everybody's paper, the professor will never know. And I was right. But somebody else knew about it. And who was that? God. I walk out of the class. God, I only have one more test to take. Thank you, Lord, for helping me. And the Spirit of God, just as sure as I'm standing, he said, I don't help cheaters. I knew I was in trouble. <clears throat> I'm trying to walk over to the hangout. We call it the spot. And I'm walking over there. And I'm trying to convince God, you know, God, listen, it, it wasn't like really cheating, cheating. You know, I just, you know, God, I can't flunk a class. I'm one of the oldest students in the school. And I can't, I can't convince God. It's only, it's less than 50 yards, 100 yards from where I was at to where I was going. By the time I got there, the spirit of Jesus had beat me almost down to a pulp. And finally I walk in and I said, okay, fine. If you really want me to tell the professor I cheated, you have him come to the spot. He never comes to the spot. I'm good. Walked, got my coffee, stirring it with cream sugar. I turn around. He is standing behind me. <laughs> and I go, oh, oh, Brother Tillis. Hey, Sam. He goes, how you doing? Oh, <laughs> Brother Tillis. <laughs> he said, what's wrong? I said, <laughs> Brother Tillis. Brother T Can I talk to you for a moment? He says, yes. Now, I've been in some crazy places. I'm not normally giving in to fear. For whatever the reason, I, didn't, I mean, I was, it's this little old professor, little bitty dude. And he says, yeah, how can I help you, Sam? I said, you know the test we just took? He says, yeah. I said, I just want you to know that I cheated on that test. He says, I'm sorry, what did you say? I said, you know the test we just took? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I just want you to know I cheated on that test. <laughs> he says, I don't understand what you're trying to say. And something inside I said, well, come on, man up, bro. Come on, man, man up. I looked at him, I said, I cheated on the test. He says, uh, <laughs> on how many questions? <laughs> and I said, oh, it's relative. I cheated, okay? I just cheated. <laughs> cheated. He looked at me, and this is what he said. You're not the only one who cheated, but you're the only one who came up and told me. He said, I'll get back at you. Do you know how much money, cash money, I've had go through my hands through my life? And I don't think I would even be where I'm at today had I not gone to the professor and said, I cheated. I cheated. Then I had to, See, when you cheat and you don't deal with it, it's going to come out somewhere else. But I've never had to deal with it. I can talk about it freely. Him and I used to laugh about it. I go to the church and preach, and he said, I've told him that story. I don't want to tell him that story. I'm not, I'm not I'm just superintendent now. I don't want to tell him that. Tell him that story. He would just laugh, just like in a theology class. They were talking about Martin Luther, Martin Luther, Martin Luther. And I looked at Pastor Bobo, and I was getting ready to say, if you call Dr. King Martin Luther one more time, I'm going to straighten out everybody in this class. You do know I'm glad I didn't straighten out the class, right? I found out who Martin Luther was. <laughs> oh, God, Jesus. God, I pray over these young people. Your presence at this altar, and even some of you didn't come down in. I know he's dealing with you. But your presence here is simply saying, God, whatever you want, I want. I heard what the preacher said today. I want everything, I want everything you have for me. And if I'm headed in a direction, God, that you don't want me to go, God, then you know what? Help me, help me to hear your voice. So I pray for you this morning. I pray. Lord, their eyes have not seen. Their ears have not heard. Their hearts have not been touched by the things you want to do in their young lives. But as they seek your face and seek your heart, you're going to reveal to them in the spiritual arena. You're going to confirm through the word of God and through those around them who are their mentors and their elders. 
So I lift this student body up before you. And I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that you would continue to work on this campus, that you would continue to touch the hearts of these young men and these young women, and that you would conform them into the image of the Holy One of Israel. I pray that you would protect these young ladies. Protect them, Lord. Protect them from themselves, if need be. Help these young men to live righteous, holy lives. Help them when they're having debates and what have you to be more concerned about the relationship than they are about being right. Help them to be concerned about being righteous than to be right. And I pray that in this room, men and women will rise up to be world changers. So we've told that to our grandchildren since the time they could understand English. They were going to change the world. Not just go to college, get a good education, get a job somewhere and make a rich man richer. But they are going to change the world. I pray for every professor, every faculty member, every administrator. I pray that the spirit of the living God would fall on this campus and just to continue that slow burn. Thank you, God, for who you are in my life and for the awesome privilege of being here today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless all of y'all. God bless all of you. God bless you. I know God has spoken to really every one of us in this room. You know, the reason I appreciate uh, Brother Sam, he speaks from the heart of a father, from a grandfather. And uh, he's, he's this amazing model of what you should frankly want to be like. You can have that. You can have a family as beautiful as his family. It may not look exactly like that. But if you choose to commit your life to God, you can have that kind of success. Because I can tell you, that kind of success, I saw that beautiful family, that kind of success is far greater than all the money in the world. But it, it comes from making a decision and then consistently living that out over the course of your lives. And that's the reason why these days are so important. And so I just simply end by saying this. Obviously, thank you, Brother Sam. Thank you for being here. But I want to, I want to, I want to say this. If you felt convicted at some point today, I want you to find a place sometime later today. Find a moment in time where you can get alone with God and you can have a conversation with Him. And then I would, I would I'd encourage you to go a step further. I would encourage you to find some person, some faculty member, some staff person, maybe it's a coach, someone you respect, and I want you to go to them and I want you to tell them what you felt like the Lord doing, was doing in your life today. And ask them to pray for you and to stand beside you. And that might take a little, obviously it's going to take a little bit of courage. But you know what? That's what it's going to take to be able to achieve that. that. In fact, if you don't want that, I've got a question You're pretty messed up if you don't want that. I'll just say that. You're pretty messed up. And I don't think you, I, I don't think there are any messed up people in this room. I think you want it. So God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this week. It's been a powerful week. And thank you for this student body. Bless them. And Jesus.